What exactly is a virus? This is a tricky question to answer because there are many different types of viruses, each with their own special structures and functions. However, there are some patterns among them. First, they tend to have two major parts. Their outer casing, made of protein, is called a capsid. And then inside they contain their nucleic acid of choice, typically DNA. Viruses cannot produce on their own, and so they are not considered living by biologists. But they can generate copies by infecting other cells. But figuring out how they do this was somewhat of a mystery, especially given that viruses are somewhere on the order of 100 nanometers in length. In 1952, researchers Hershey and Chase ran a series of experiments that solved some of this mystery. In addition to explaining how viruses work, these experiments also got to the bottom of a very important question. So, say you have a cell. Let's say it's a prokaryotic bacterium with a circular chromosome in it. And then suddenly, this bacterium is being infected by a virus. Hershey and Chase knew that the virus landed on the outside of the cell, but they weren't sure at that point, but they weren't sure whether they infected the cell by sticking in the DNA or part of the protein capsid, and so they ran an experiment to test that. Hershey and Chase were unsure whether protein or DNA contained the genetic information that the virus needed to put into the cell in order to infect it, because both protein and DNA have complex structures. These structures are also similar in that they contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. However, there is one key difference. Protein contains sulfur, while DNA contains phosphorus, and and they use this to their advantage as they tested for how viruses work. To figure out whether the virus's code was DNA or protein, Hershey and Chase needed to use their basic knowledge of these two macromolecules. Like any molecule, they're very small and hard to see. Also, they're remarkably similar to each other in that they both contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. The only lucky difference is that DNA contains phosphorus in its phosphate groups, whereas protein contains sulfur that help hold the complex structures of the protein together. So Hershey and Chase decided to use this to their advantage by choosing radioactive isotopes of these two elements. So remember that radioactive substances give off radiation and would thus make it easier for Hershey and Chase to detect them. They began by growing one half of their viruses in the presence of a radioactive isotope, uh, radioactive sulfur-35, which you could see was put in a medium inside this beaker right here. To the medium, they added a bunch of bacteria as food for the viruses and the viruses themselves and let the viruses go along and infect the bacteria. After some time, they then took this mixture, threw it in a blender to break off the capsids of the viruses, um, and then separate them from the bacteria themselves by spinning them very fast in a machine called a centrifuge, which causes the heavy bacterial cells to go sinking to the bottom of this test tube right here in this lower region, and leaving the rest of the empty protein shells, the empty capsids, to go floating up here in the liquid. Lastly, they took samples of this area at the bottom and samples from the liquid and they tested them for radioactivity. And what did they find? In the liquid, plenty of radioactive sulfur, while in the bacteria, none. So, do viruses infect cells with proteins? No, otherwise we would have seen some of the radioactivity in the bacteria themselves. So then they took the complementary question, do viruses infect cells with nucleic acids, such as DNA? To find that out, they grew the viruses in the same predicament, only this time with radioactive phosphorus, which is found inside their DNA. Allowed them to grow, and you can see the little viruses right here with their DNA, all aglow with radioactivity, and gave them time to infect the bacteria, put them in the blender again, ran them through the centrifuge, and then measured for radioactivity both in the liquid and in the pellet at the bottom. And what did they find? Inside the bacteria this time, there was plenty of radioactivity, this time indicating that the viruses must have 
taken up that radioactivity and then injected it into the bacterium, which implies that yes, the viruses do inject nucleic acids like DNA, uh, and that's why the radioactivity was detectable. Also at this time, in 1953, when Hershey and Chase published their paper, it became established that nucleic acids must be the source of coding for organisms and small non-organisms alike. Following is a very brief summary of what science now knows about viruses and how they infect cells. You've got your host cell, let's say it's that bacterium again with its single circular chromosome floating in its cytoplasm. And it's chillin' like prokaryotes like to do, and we could even say maybe there's a DNA polymerase enzyme that's zipping along the chromosome and starting to make another copy of it. But then along comes the virus, which uses its protein capsid to dock on the outside of the cell, and then it injects its DNA inside. Now, the DNA polymerase doesn't know any better. It sees this DNA as like, oh, hmm, some DNA, I guess I'll copy it. And it starts making copy after copy, after copy. And the cell is overwhelmed. There's now all of this viral DNA inside the cell telling the cell not to go and make its own chromosome like it was before, but instead to make more viruses. And it keeps doing this until eventually the cell explodes. And the new viruses can emerge and go off to infect other cells. So next time you're lying there, sick as a dog, from the cold that you just got from some other person, you can lie there and enjoy the thought that small protein capsids filled with DNA are invading your very cells and turning them into virus-making factories, and that's why you feel miserable.